Hi, everyone. I'm going to introduce uh, Wendy Phillips as we begin uh, to open up this incredible ceremony uh, first and then um, our session for first exposure. Wendy Phillips is an Indigenous elder. She's of the Bald Eagle Clan. She's Potawatomi and Ojibwe and a proud member of the Wasoxing First Nation. It's in the heart of the Muskokas. She's a keeper of the eight fire prophecies, keeper of the ancient Thunderbird calendar, ceremonial leader, spiritual educator, cultural innovator, and traditional indigenous healer. Uh, if that's not enough, she just got her master's at York University. <laughs> Wendy's gonna open us up. Oh, bonjour. Megazi dodem. A widow cause a bergot and dishon cause. Saksing the Dunji, you wait in Zibin and Dunjaba, German Mark Gay Parwad mean down. Jimmy Gwach can a gay go gaja top, Jimmy Gwach Nishangish got Jimmy Gwach, Atokan, Atokanak, Jimmy Gwach Bobbin on my doge, I went on my doge, Finch Mark Madog, you went my door, Jimmy Gwach a key, Jimmy Gwach Nimki Beneshi, Jimmy Gwach Majika, Jimmy Gwach, Shomas, Nokomas, Manan Bojo, Nen Wabe, Swabe, Nishode, Shikakam, Mamagas, Wan, Shabe, Sak. At this time, there are, um, when we gather, there are some things that we are required to do. And, and this is uh, for us as Anishinaabe people that we uh, conduct a smudging ceremony. So I was actually going to ask um, Mark to, to come up and to uh, light this smudge. So, so this is uh, for us, it's a traditional purification ceremony. So this is uh, what we're using today is sage. And the smoke, we usually ask people to put their hands in the smoke like you're washing your hands and then to, to put the smoke over your body. And so for, for this, this is um, traditionally uh, when we gather that we all come from different areas and this is a, a possibility that some of us may have different bacterias and viruses that we are carrying. And the, the purpose of our smudges is to ensure that those contaminants, uh, you know, they're eliminated as soon as you smudge. So, so research has discovered this over the last few years, that as soon as you smudge, 95% of the contaminants that you have are eliminated. And then within this room, it'll be 100% within 24 hours. So for us, the importance of our smudges are um, a health benefit um, to eliminate uh, those uh, viruses and bacteria that we struggle with in this time of year. And, and this is uh, for us, you know, a normal time of year that, you know, we see different colds and uh, different, different issues that we are facing. So we, we also understand that people um, may have your, your own, you know, traditional um, ceremonies as well to do, and, but you're welcome to partake in this as well. So, so we'll ask for those who are willing uh, to come down. Um, just because of the aisle seating, it's, it's hard to, to walk in between the, the aisles with, the, with this smudge, so you can uh, come down if you are uh, willing to, to partake in this this part of the ceremony. So, and as that's going on, I'm I'm going to uh, continue with uh, some of the words that I had shared during the the opening. And I'm of the Ojibwe Nation, so I am Potawatomi, which are the keepers of the fire, and Jumandamuk, which are people with excellent memories. 
and those are the two dialect families of our nation. As the Ojibwe Nation, we are one of the largest nations in Canada. And some, some nations um, uh, may uh, not, not agree with that, um, but that's something uh, we like to say. Um, just because we have so many dialects uh, within our nation. And here in Toronto especially, uh, the, the Mississaugas are, are one of those uh, dialect families within our nation. Uh, same with the Odawa, the Soto, and the Oji Cree, and the Chippewa. So, so for us, uh, when you include those nations, that it makes the, the Ojibwe nation um, quite larger. So, so this is for, for us when we uh, talk about the Anishinaabe people, that it is, a, it is a great nation amongst the Americas because we do have our nation represented in the United States as well, that we are probably the, the second um, largest nation in the United States and we do uh, have families down in um, Mexico as, as well. So, so for us, when we, when we talk about our, our nationhood, that um, for, for us we have uh, many things that we have, you know, attempted to encourage and to continue to encourage, especially on our territory. And for, for us, we have many treaties that we hope are still honored today. And some of these are what we describe as the dish with one spoon. This is for, for us, it includes uh, this, this part of uh, Ontario. So, so we encourage people to honor this particular treaty as it is in relation to our resources and, and how we treat one another and how we are to, to live amongst each other. The intention is that, you know, one of the, the beautiful things about our medicine wheels is that it has the, the four directions. And that's what I had given acknowledgements to in my opening. And the, the four directions is a very special symbol to us. That it is one describing um, the, the four directions, but it's also describing uh, what we um, also recognize are the, the four races of our human family. And, and this is uh, one of the, the beautiful things about our creation story is the, the unity that it implies and represents. And this is, you know, for our ancestors and our elders have always encouraged us to always recognize that there's other races within our human family and that we are all equal and we all have a part in what we describe as this circle of life, this, this circle of creation. So, so we all have a part in this. So, so for us, when we talk about life, that this is a very important concept to us that a human life is seen as the most sacred being that exists. For, for us as Anishinaabe people, you know, we are thankful that we, we have this great gift. And we see ourselves, one of our principles, as spiritual beings first. As a human being, it is seen as secondary. And for us as a spiritual being to evolve, it is to have a human experience. 
And for, for us in our creation story, it is seen that to, to have a human experience is one of the most precious experiences that a spiritual being can have. And we are very fortunate as a human being to exist. And so this is for us when we talk about, you know, these principles and these values as Indigenous people, there are some similarities amongst our nations. And, and this is one of the, the beautiful things with our Ongoi Hoe brothers and sisters that, you know, they, they share a lot of those similar principles. And for us, when we, when we talk about um, our great laws, that we are to honor life. And, and this is, I think, one of the most beautiful things uh, when we talk about first exposure, that it is bringing together all of us as a human family. And, and to me, that is one of the most beautiful things uh, with this particular project. And so I'm really excited. I'm really excited to, you know, be part of uh, this, this project. It's very important work, as a lot of you know. Um, sadly, you know, for a lot of our Indigenous communities and families and mothers and, and children, that sadly, you know, there are so many negative numbers as to what we're facing and and this is preventable and and this is you know one of the the hopes you know from projects like this by working together that we can begin addressing these issues so so this is for for myself a, a very exciting uh, project and I'm, I'm really happy to see, you know, especially um, for, for us here in uh, Toronto, that um, to see many of our partners here today and, you know, to, to see everyone come out. And so, so there's, uh, for us, there's, you know, quite a few more that are on our team as well. And, um, you know, this is uh, some of the things I, I hope that, um, you know, within within time, that uh, you'll be able to to see them over the the next little while. So, I'm very thankful that uh, you know we can begin this in a, a very good way. And so, so when we talk about you know taking responsibility for those seven generations, that it is our responsibility to to care. And, and this is uh, for us as soon as that life comes, that we, we have a duty, we have an obligation to ensure the quality of life, especially new life, when it arrives. And there are so many teachings, you know, not only for the parents, but for the family as to how to uh, care for a new one that that enters and and this is you know some of the the beautiful things that you know our our journey will begin to you know captivate those things and and honor those things as well as as we go and and this is I think one of the the beautiful things about this particular project is the inclusion of the nations that are here. And, and to me, I think that's um, one of the, the most beautiful things that we can, we can ask for is, you know, working together and especially with our um, time that we're in, that we are leaders and we need to work together in a positive way to provide that role modeling, that guidance to those future generations. And that's only possible 
if we're able to work together and to, to demonstrate that with the work that we do. And so, so this is what we describe our, you know, to put forward those good thoughts, to put forward, you know, those good intentions. So to, to have a good heart, to have a good spirit, to have a good body, to have a good mind. And all of these things are so important for the quality of life, for not only when we talk about uh, an infant, but also the, the whole family unit. And so when we talk about when this is possible, then those future generations have that possibility as well. And on just a closing, when we talk about responsibility, it is what we talk about is um, when we honor life, it's, it's honoring the, the blood that we have and how sacred that is. And when we, when we move on through that Western door, our bodies will decompose and they will go into the earth and that's what will stay for those seven generations is what's in your body. It'll eventually break down to, to different minerals. But sadly, whatever contaminants you have put in your body will also go into the soil. And, and that's something for us, you know, we've often spoke about is you know, what you do to yourself is what you do to the earth. And so, so for us, when we talk about responsibility, whether you have children or not, that the impacts your body will have on future generations is your responsibility. So the problems we face today with climate change and the state of our planet is, is our responsibility. And, and this is, you know, for us, when we talk about first exposure, it's addressing, you know, some of those issues that, you know, sadly, a lot of our communities have contaminated water. The, the soil, the land is not healthy. And so, so this is, you know, what some of our families are, are currently facing. So, so this is, you know, for myself, some of the things we, we think of and we ask for good health and long life and peace of mind for, for everyone here and all your loved ones and those ones that couldn't be here today. And I like to say uh, miigwech for everyone coming today and participating in our ceremony today. And yes, I'll pass it on. Thank you. Now we're going to see a little video of the program, and um, then we're going to hear from our dean. I'm very proud, uh, Dr. France Gagnon. So we'll see the movie, and then you'll hear from Franz. The health of the people begins in the ground of the pregnant person's body and is transgenerational. During this most critical window of preconception and prenatal development, an individual's first environment, first relationship, first experience, and first exposure, the health of the nation is determined. Equity is very important to me. My partner comes from Jamaica. I'm a newcomer to Canada. As someone who is pregnant for the first time, it's very important to find information that is equity-oriented, but also evidence-based. 
and coming from very safe sources. There is a long tradition of pregnant individuals not being included in all different types of clinical research as well as medication and drug trials. So pregnancy is often a very joyous, exciting time, but often it can also be a little bit stressful for families and they need to make decisions that they feel are healthy for themselves or their babies. There's just so many unknowns and uncertainties and misinformation, especially in this day and age due to social media. See if you can just get the baby. It is essential that I have up-to-date, appropriate information so that I can give that information to my clients or I can say, you can look this up yourself. The goal is to create knowledge and to share that knowledge with parents families and caregivers to better understand the impact of different substances and medications. It's an online hub to really provide evidence-based information that's readily understandable, that's evidence-based, that's easy to access. First Exposure is a stepping stone in the right direction to support a safer space to build trust with Black communities. First Exposure is my delivery partner, like a partner that you have with you, that you can consult online, that you can go towards for advice. <laughs> it is a place of sharing, information sharing. If somebody is considering getting pregnant, if they are pregnant, or if they're lactating or chest feeding, they can look up any substance and decide for themselves. This is an opportunity to start to collect the information that is available on the impact of medications and substances on pregnant individuals. It's going to be free, it's accessible to everybody, it's been done ethically with a broad focus on harm reduction, and it's something that is non-judgmental. We have assembled a team of medical experts as well as privacy experts at the university and others to help ensure that the information is accurate and evidence-based and there is strict privacy protocols in place uh, to protect that information and to protect those who access the website. So First Exposure provides me with a sense of security that we have access to reliable and credible information regarding my safety and the safety of our future child. This is really going to revolutionize the way families in Canada interact with reproductive health information. The future is indeed very bright. First Exposure embraces all of the elements I would be looking for in seeking information to give the utmost and best care. We're really excited about working with First Exposure and support the bringing to light of information. It becomes a resource, it becomes a way to make sure that everybody has access to the quality of care that everybody deserves. Hello everyone, uh, welcome both here in person and those joining us virtually. And bienvenue à tous, uh, à ceux qui sont en personne et ceux qui sont, nous joignent uh, virtuellement. Et j'apprécie l'opportunité de pouvoir parler en français en même temps aujourd'hui. Uh, thank you for being here to celebrate the launch of our new program, First Exposure. And thank you to Women's College for sharing this beautiful sp space uh, with us for this uh, important launch. My name is France Gagnon. Uh, I am the acting dean, not the dean. Um, <laughs> and at the University of Toronto, we are very proud to host First Exposure, a much needed program uh, for pregnant people and new parents. Uh, we are grateful for the Vora Miller Foundation generous uh, donation that has led to the creation of this important program. And we're delighted that the foundation co-founder, Sabina Vora Miller, chose the school for its home. Uh, for us, the pairing uh, of Sabina with uh, the program has already resulted in great synergy. With a background in clinical uh, pharmacology and toxicology, Sabina Vora-Miller value healthcare and what it goes in the making of a high quality healthcare. She's exceptionally vested in making sustainable, systemic, meaningful, intentional changes to healthcare in Canada. That is uh, why Sabina focuses her um, efforts and advocacy on making healthcare uh, accessible for all. Currently, there's nothing like first exposure in Canada. It is a digital hub, information hub, providing evidence-based information to patients 
and health care providers on the safety of medication, plant, and rental substances, and other exposure during pregnancy and lactation. This is why we believe uh, you will see a rapid growth in the program, uh, and it has the support of several of our leading faculty behind it, uh, from the Dalalana School of Public Health, uh, the Temerty uh, Faculty of Medicine, and the Leslie uh, Dan School of Pharmacy. We are pleased to be working with researchers and partners across the country, uh, some of whom are here today, and I'm looking forward to uh, some conversation with you. Uh, dean Staney Brown, the real dean, <laughs> and I have been working uh, together bringing first exposure to this stage, and we are proud of its debut. Uh, we are working closely with the program leadership, including the exec executive director, when, uh, Wendy uh, Catherine, a midwife, health care, uh, health midwife and health strategist who is working with the university to implement first exposure, leading the team at the community-based nonprofit bilingual Nonprofit uh, bilingual health promotion organization, Health Nexus, at the Dalanana, uh, del as a del Dalanana delivery partner on first exposure. Uh, medical content director, Cindy Maxwell, with, who is here today and who we saw on uh, the video, who, with whom we just, well, we just saw on the screen. We are grateful, grateful to uh, Dr. Maxwell for her leadership and her support of first exposure. You can see that Cindy is capable and generous contribution to the program in every aspect and her commitment in it. For evidence reviews to the sensitivity of her partnership work to the fearless ethics she brings to the work. So thank you very much, Cindy. And finally, a scientific director, Dr. Jennifer Blake. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you work with uh, Sabina Vora Miller to bring the idea of first exposure to the university after an accomplished uh, career as an obstetrician gynecologist uh, and a clinician leader and executive, and executive uh, Dr. Blake helped see this program from conception to birth. Uh, from, we are so fortunate to have the Ravora Miller Foundation and Dr. Blake working with us to bring this foundation uh, to this program to a su successful start. We look forward to hypothesis generating research uh, from uh, first exposure, what it will stimulate. I do have a bias on that because my real job is Associate Dean of Research, so yes, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we know that community members and organizations are also interested in working uh, with us to look more close closely at clinical outcomes related to medical exposure. We are excited about the program future, and we are glad uh, that you are here today to share this lounge. And now I'll take a brief moment to thank uh, the francophone <laughs> attendees. I, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> thank you. Je vous remercie très sincèrement uh, de votre participation, de votre collaboration uh, francophone to this program, uh, pour faire en sorte que First Exposure soit un program bilingue. C'est vraiment un plaisir aussi de pouvoir parler en français aujourd'hui à Toronto et je pense que c'est une caractéristique spéciale de First Exposure. To our uh, Anglophone attendee, I am uh, grateful and I thank you for your patience with my thick French Canadian accent. Mm -hmm. And now I would like to have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Blake and um, I will pass the microphone to you. Thank you very much and welcome. And my microphone clearly is not working, <laughs> but this one is. So let me begin with a few um, thank yous. I, we have to begin with, with appreciation, and then my job is to tell you a little bit more about why we have this program and how we do our work and what you can expect when you come to visit our site. So my first thank you is to someone who cannot be with us today, and that's to Dr. Shinya Ito. We've talked about how first exposure uh, was created because there was a gap. There was a gap in the information and knowledge that we needed. Well, that gap 
happened uh, when the program that Dr. Shinya Ito had been leading up until 2018, uh, the Mother Risk Helpline and Information Service, uh, had to be closed at a hospital for sick children. I want to sincerely thank Shinya for all that he contributed and then has helped us to do um, subsequently to find um, a way of creating a new program to fill that space. And I also want to thank the people who were part of that program for many years, a program that served 25,000 calls a year. Just think of that for a moment. That tells you how large the gap is that we're here to fill. I want to thank Dr. David Naylor, who was the CEO at Sick Kids at the time and who understood what an important program this was and who uh, wanted to make sure that somehow, some way, a program could be created that would uh, fill this gap. And that leads me to Dean Staney Brown, who, uh, was, who, who really gave us a home where we could uh, get to work and come up with something that, that uh, grew uh, into ways that probably could never have otherwise been imagined. I need to thank the first exposure team that got to work and came up with this idea. Shinya Ito, Joel Ray, Chital Gandhi, Simon Vigod, Sabina, Vora Miller, and Brad Quinn, all there at the beginning. And then the Health Nexus team, which became our incredible partner to be able to take an idea and make it come to life. And Wendy and your team, who are all here, our first exposure team. Anna Popko, Pina Bozo, I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards. <laughs> our, our subject matter experts, John Zapersky, Tally Bogler, Jay McGilvery, from whom we've learned so much, and Cindy Maxwell, my colleague from uh, Mount Sinai. I want to thank the community members and leaders who really helped us to understand what the needs were and how we could make ourselves available for them. And I have special, special thanks for my friend Sabina. Uh, without whom this, this gap would probably still be a gap. So what is first exposure? You've heard that it's an information service and it's about the safety of various exposures during pregnancy, including medications, substances from coffee to recreational drugs, alcohol, environmental and household exposures. It's designed for those who are pregnant or nursing a child, or anyone considering a pregnancy, and it's for their health care providers. It will advocate for the healthiest possible pregnancies, and if you know anything about the people we work with, you'll be hearing our voice. Our website will be starting with a very small handful of substances, so when you go, I just want to set expectations that we're not starting off with the full 200 or 500 substances that we will eventually have. We're starting off with a small number, but you'll see how we go about doing our work. Each one that you can read about has been rigorously researched, and all the information has been reviewed both by medical experts and by community representatives and leaders and equity advisors to make sure that we're giving you the information that is, that is relevant and usable. And why is this important? As Wendy talked about, we're talking about the seven generations. We were probably all taught that you get your genes from your mother and your father, and that's that, and that's who you are. But we know that that's not the case. We know that, in fact, the environment that we're exposed to changes those genes. And the changes that happen in those genes aren't just affecting you. They are affecting your DNA that will be passed on to subsequent generations. So if you take the example of bisphenol A, we know it causes epigenetic change. And we know actually that the blood levels of epigenetic, of, of, of BS, bisphenol A, are higher in babies who are being breastfed than they are in babies who were being formula fed because we protect babies and infants from bisphenol A, but we don't protect mothers and parents. So when you get a cash register ta tape and it feels a little bit slippery, that's bisphenol A. When you get a tin can that's lined with something plasticky, that's bisphenol A. And bisphenol A was originally designed as an estrogen. And if you knew that your can of tomatoes was lined with estrogen, I bet you'd think twice about how, how whether that's the right way to line a can of, of tomatoes. 
So we want to be able to make sure that we provide information, not just on drugs, but on the whole environment that surrounds that baby. In fact, when it comes to exposures, we're talking about nail polish, cosmetics, alcohol, cannabis. Cannabis was just in the CMAJ because there's uh, been a doubling of mothers at risk. Wildfire smoke, occupational exposures. It said today that babies are exposed to over 90 compounds in utero. And as early as 1992, we knew that the fluid that bathes the baby, the amniotic fluid, has higher levels of organochlorine, PCPs, and hydrocarbons than does the maternal serum. It's concentrated in the baby's exposures, which led researchers to say that our babies are born pre-polluted, a situation that we need to change. So how does our data arrive that we use to create this database? Well, we have a, a lot of data that we had to begin with, but we wanted to assemble a high quality database. And so we've established standard procedures that enable a very robust process that can stand up to scrutiny and is 100% free of bias or commercial interest. Our team works with an amazing medical librarian to search the world's literature on the substances we are looking into. And that can yield thousands of papers of varying quality. And as Cindy said, we don't include women in our clinical trials. In fact, we have spent years trying to protect women and pregnant people from research as opposed to understanding that people can be best protected through good quality research. We have a clinical content team that reviews these articles and using set criteria selects those that are relevant to the question and of, and of really good scientific quality. The findings are extracted and then we get together with our subject matter experts, including both clinical and community and equity expertise, to discuss how to interpret the data before arriving at a consensus. After an equity review, the information all goes off to Cindy who signs off on the content and the conclusions that we've reached. We also prepare peer-reviewed health topic pages to give an overview on common health topics, such as mental health, or cold and flu, or vaccination, or many others which will be um, coming. All this work is done under the oversight of an advisory committee under the leadership of the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. So when can you get access to the site? Well, it starts today with our website, with the information that we have available. But as you check back, you'll see that we will be adding more and more and more. We have a very full pipeline, and we have a very hardworking, committed team. We will be going into a next phase of our website where we're looking to build in interactivity, and we're looking to build back the kind of real-time advice that people have told us that they want but we have to walk before we can run. It is our intention to be able to provide answers to your questions and interact to provide them in a timely fashion. And we'll also be building our clinical referral network to those who need to have specialized advice to guide their decision making. So I cannot begin to tell you, it's been a very long road to get here, um, but we are here, we are launched. And like any launch pad, it just accelerates the speed. So I am very pleased now to introduce uh, my good friend, Sabina um, Vora Miller, to come and talk to us about uh, what, her, what her perspective on this. Sabina, for those of you who don't know her, has a wonderful uh, website that she has uh, built up that, that provides evidence base for, for the, the public using social media to provide the information that people need. Uh, Sabina and I met five years ago over a telephone call, and without her, uh, without that telephone call, none of us would be here today. Do I need to use this or no? Okay. I can't believe you're here. I just can't. This just feels so surreal. Imagine waking up one day and wondering all the typical things you used to do yesterday without giving a second thought might not be okay today. Because today you found out 
that you're pregnant. The sushi you ate last night, the face cream you put on this morning, the cough and cold medicine you need to, uh, you need to get some rest when you're sick, the essential chronic medication that you need to stay healthy. And then imagine not knowing who to ask these questions or having to agonizingly wait until your next prenatal appointment to have them addressed. That is the reality that pregnant and nursing people across Canada have had to face for the last several years and what we hope to change today. The Vora Miller Foundation was created nearly four years ago. In fact, the week we went into lockdown in March of 2020. But the story of first exposure, in fact, predates that. My husband, Craig Miller, and I created our foundation with the goal of improving the health of the planet and its people. Our goal is to make people thrive by building resilient and healthier communities. As a first generation immigrant woman and a mother myself, I know firsthand that there are many gaps in the Canadian healthcare space, inequities in access to care and information based on one's gender and race are not uncommon. These health disparities are significant and they are systemic. The day we heard the news of the previous maternal and child health program, Mother Risk, being shut down, my husband Craig and I said, almost in unison, that there is only one thing left to do. And it wasn't simply to bring it back, but to set out to create a world-class program that is robust, evidence-driven, ethical, and credible. A comprehensive and trusted resource for anyone seeking accurate information on medications, substances, and exposures during pregnancy and lactation. But we couldn't do this alone. We tapped into some of Canada's most brilliant people and brought in incredible expertise across multiple disciplines and through lived experiences. We used a very intentional approach to embed equity and inclusivity into every aspect of this work, all while being grounded in science and knowledge. And we've created magic. Magic that will empower pregnant and nursing people to make the best decisions for themselves and their children. I still remember the day we landed on the name. <laughs> I'm looking right at you, Jenny. We were huddled all day in a meeting room at Shopify that my husband Craig booked for us because we didn't really have anywhere else to be, struggling to find a name that resonated, one that was inclusive, but also not fear-based. Jenny suddenly said, I've got it. Let's call it first exposure. It fit all the requirements and we were so thrilled, but the domain wasn't available. <laughs> it was, um, it was actually used to house pictures from a volunteer trip and hadn't been updated in many, many, many years. I found out who owned the domain and sent countless emails, messages through LinkedIn and literally every social media outlet over multiple weeks. I figured he probably was not receiving my messages. The thought that he was ignoring me never crossed my mind. <laughs> Finally, I found his number and I called him. I said, hi. <laughs> my name is Sabina, and I'm calling to speak to you about your website, firstexposure.ca. There was a long pause, and then he said, boy, are you resilient. You just don't give up, do you? <laughs> and we don't. Our entire team has worked day and night for the last four years against so many obstacles and so many challenges, but we knew the importance and we knew we had to do it right. First Exposure embodies everything our foundation is focused on, making sustainable, systemic, impactful changes to healthcare by providing families with evidence-based and easily accessible information in a timely and dignified way. This has been a passion project for me and for many reasons is profoundly meaningful on a personal level. As Joyce Banda, Malawi's first female president and a multiple award-winning champion of women's and girls' rights once said, I quote, the seeds of success in every nation on earth are best planted in women and children. A healthy and thriving community needs healthy and, th and thriving mothers and children. And today, we get one step closer to achieving that. So thank you for being here today as we launch First Exposure, I am so 
so grateful for all of you, for all of your support. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in about 15 minutes. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, it's time to start the second half of the program. Um, so I am so excited to be here for this launch of First Exposure. Thanks to the generous support of the Vora Miller Foundation, we now have this amazing network and resource um, that is essential for both providers as well as pregnant and lactating individuals to use at their fingertips. So who am I? because you haven't heard of me. <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know, I got the pleasure of joining um, this team at the 11th hour to help with the launch. Um, my name is Seema Marwaha, and I'm an internal medicine specialist, and I'm also the editor-in-chief of a publication called Healthy Debate. And I'm your moderator for the second half of the program. Um, I'm also coming to this with my lens as a mother of two boys, and coming off of a recent maternity leave. My youngest is 14 months old. And, and I believe so much in first exposure because after both of my pregnancies, I developed a new condition called hyperthyroidism that I hadn't had before. And it was causing all of these symptoms. It's essentially a condition where your thyroid gland produces way too much thyroid hormone. And it was causing palpitations and nervousness and anxiety. And to control those symptoms, I was prescribed four new medications while I was breastfeeding. And it just caused so much additional anxiety. I, I just wasn't sure if I was doing the right thing for myself, and I wasn't sure if I was doing the right thing for my baby. Um, and that anxiety doesn't go away. And I realized that there was a gap. I was missing that check, that trusted resource that I could go to, to say and give me reassurance that I was doing the right thing. And I'm so passionate about the launch today because I see the potential for first exposure to fill that gap. I think we have a lot to pack in in the next 45 to 50 minutes, which we'll try to keep it to. So I'm gonna to try to keep things really tight. Um, the format of the next hour is gonna be a round table chat with these lovely experts that we have, and I get the privilege of moderating. We have an esteemed panel joining us who cross a variety of disciplines and have um, lots of experiences to share with us. And each person is connected to first exposure in a unique and distinct way. And we'll bring a different lens to this conversation, and I really hope that that comes out. So my goal is to have a frank and honest discussion about the goals, aspirations, and challenges of building a national pregnancy and lactation safety program. So without further ado, I'm going to now shift <laughs> to my second seat. Um, and we're going to introduce our, our panelists who have been waiting really patiently up here. Um, so the way this is going to work is Everyone here has bios that could take half an hour for me to go through, so I'm going to do one line, but instead of me reading your bio, I'm actually going to ask you to explain to us in a sentence or two what actually inspires you about or excites you or connects you to first exposure. Um, I'm going to keep you guys each to one to two sentences if possible, just as a bit of a teaser, uh, just given the time, but I just really want people to understand where each and every person on this panel is coming from. So first up, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Cindy Maxwell, um, who is Vice President of Medical Affairs and System Transformation at Women's College, an OBGYN, and as we've heard, the Medical Director, Medical Content Director of First Exposure. So Cindy, you're first up. How are you connected to or inspired by First Exposure? Thank you so much for the introduction, and so happy to be here. Uh, first Exposure is very near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, as uh, we've been just chatting in the last few minutes, it's really fostered a sense of community amongst the people who've been working on this project for the last several years um, and grateful to be welcomed into new communities as well. Um, as an obstetrician gynecologist and maternal fetal medicine specialist um, in, in my practice with uh, the, the patients, the pregnant folks and families that I take care of, um, I work in an area where chronic conditions impacting pregnancy are the reality. So I take care of people, for example, who are diagnosed with cancer during pregnancy and maybe um, uh, needing to make decisions about whether to take chemotherapy or other medications in pregnancy that most folks maybe don't really think about. Um, another example uh, is in the area of inflammatory bowel disease, so conditions like ulcerative colitis and 
Crohn's disease. Um, and so uh, these conditions are typically <coughs> lifelong illnesses which require one or more medications to control. And uh, questions about how to manage some of the newer medications that are now on the market to, um, to, control, it, to control symptoms during pregnancy it, it releases an endless set of questions. So, you know, the, the, the relevance of this work is, is so, um, so powerful and very much uh, a part of, uh, you know, what I, what I um, think about as an obstetrician when, with my patients uh, and uh, with their family members. Um, the other um, great joy uh, that I've experienced working with first exposure, sorry, this is more than two sentences. That's okay, I'm, I'm going to let this one slide. That's okay. <laughs> this is my last <laughs> sentence, I promise. Um, ha has been, it's been an absolute privilege uh, to work with Dr. Roberta Timothy, um, a, a professor here at the Dalawana School of Public Health, um, the Black Health Lead. Um, and together, uh, we co lead the Black Village Leadership Circle of First Exposure. Um, and uh, so this is another community uh, that's been forming and has been such a wonderful experience. Um, the importance of that work, uh, of course, is to ensure that black voices are heard throughout uh, the, the work, the, the research, the knowledge translation, knowledge sharing of first exposure, um, and to ensure that um, you know, our black communities are, are protected uh, and represented in all of this work. So. There's, there's my two sentences. <laughs> I think everyone can now have three sentences. <laughs> um, but I think those themes of community and partnership are going to come up throughout this discussion. So I'm really happy that we have that jumping off point. But next, we have Wendy Catherine, who is a midwife by background, also has an MBA from Rotman, and is a student in the Doctorate of Public Health program at Dalai Lana. So Wendy, I have the same question for you. How are you connected to or inspired by First Exposure? Well, this has been quite a journey. Um, certainly for me as a midwife by background, this is my, the passion of being with this population. And the gap of the former program not being around meant that for the organization I work with at Health Nexus, with the primary care, prenatal care providers, there just wasn't a resource we could go to anymore. It, it, the gap was really felt on the day to day. Um, here we are in a province where um, you know, 150,000 or more pregnant individuals, but many of them um, are not able to be in primary prenatal care at the beginning of pregnancy when some of these issues count the most. And so in lieu of that, and in lieu of all the pressures we know from the health system, from health human resources, not just obstetricians, but nurses, midwives, physicians of all stripes, and the social work system, this represented a, a platform of information that people could come themselves, where they could really be empowered to get the information, learn about it, and make those decisions. And to me, that's, that's trajectory changing. It's not just about that one-to-one, -one, but it makes a difference across the whole population. So to me, this was bringing a small team together to do something really powerful. And um, here we are after a short time. But uh, this, has been, this is a great day. I think, you know, filling a gap and meeting people where they are, I think those are other themes that we've heard come out and hopefully will come out more in this discussion. Um, so joining us all the way from Quebec is Dr. Anique Berard, who's a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Medications and Pregnancy and a perinatal pharmacoepidemiologist. I want to make sure I get that right. And Anique, I want to know what your connection is to first exposure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me all the way from Quebec. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm over the past, well, 20 years, but even more intensively over the past five years, I've, you know, uh, me and my colleagues, so I'm not the only one there, we're over 100 across Canada. Well, first of all, I have to mention, I'm not a clinician, I'm a researcher, <laughs> so we have to be clear. And obviously, we're about 100 across Canada, and we've put together the Canadian Mother-Child Initiative on Drug Safety and Pregnancy. And within this initiative, we have, obviously, the research arm. So we do research. We generate knowledge. But we also have a training platform, so we give a lot of virtual uh, training on how best to identify teratogen. You know, we need to have epidemiology background, but also, also toxicology, pharmacogenomics, and so forth. Um, but also, recently, we've added an extra arm to our initiative to do knowledge dissemination. Because um, we might not know this, but over 75% of Canadian 
pregnant individuals will take a medication during their pregnancy. So it can be from Tylenol to an antiepileptic. So <laughs> the range is quite wide. But a lot of women will take a medication for which there's very little data on risks. We always think of risks, but also on benefits. Uh, during pregnancy. And this is important because some pregnant women will stop taking their much needed medications because they're afraid of their risk for their fetus. Uh, we treat the mother, we're worried about the fetus, this is a funny nine months. Um, so the reason, so within the CAMCO outreach program, our knowledge dissemination, we aim to put in place Something not the same, but similar to first exposure in terms of interactive platform uh, with regards to medication exposure in pregnancy. We focus on medication, and this is how I got to know all this great team uh, because we're doing something not the same, but very similar, so we thought it would be better to team up. Yeah, lots of potential partnerships and working together with the goal of this really being a national thing, I think, eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to move on to Annette Paul. Hi, good to see you. Um, so Annette is the Executive Director of Advancement at Haverhill College, um, but used to be with us at Dalai Lama just before that. Um, so Annette, what inspires you about first exposure? Uh, well, when Sabina and Craig first uh, brought the idea to Dalai Lama School, I was there. So I helped work on the donation with Sabina and with, uh, with Stanley Brown. And um, so, you know, it was um, a really fun time for us to put it together and kind of make it happen. So. Um, I feel like this is obviously a really important day um, four years later because uh, it happened just before the pandemic. So there was a lot of uh, <clears throat> you know, stuff that happened not in person. Um, so great to see that it, it, uh, it coming to fruition. Um, but the other reason I think that uh, it inspires me is um, about 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I had you know, about nine months of cancer treatment. And so to your point, Cindy, about that, and then I just started a round of tamoxifen when, <clears throat> when I became pregnant. And I was quite terrified because I thought I'm gonna do all of these things to my baby and, and all of these things. And so, um, but I had access to information um, and on, an oncologist and, and others. And um, this program made me think about the people that don't have easy access to information and who'd like it at their fingertips, especially these days. They may not wanna wait for an appointment and things of that nature. So, um, so it inspires me for that reason. That's great. And my baby is right there. She's 13. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, so last but, but certainly not least, we have Sarah Wolf, who is both a registered midwife and registered nurse. She's also the board chair at Health Nexus. So Sarah, how do you connect to First Exposure? Uh, in two sentences, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a little bit more. I think I've been a little lax with that. So. Um, well, so obviously I have some direct connections in that, you know, my role at um, Health Nexus as the, you know, the, the key delivery partner, community delivery partner with uh, this amazing project for exposure is one of my most direct connections. But uh, also as a practitioner, I remember the, you know, the, the knowledge source that we had when, you know, mother risk exists. And so we've all acknowledged this, um, this big gap that we have in that information. I was also a midwife who was working with, within my community. And so I'm Anishinaabe. Uh, I have been part of the Toronto Indigenous community for 20 years. And we also know that mother risk um, had a role in some really deep harms that happened with very particular communities and especially the Indigenous community, the Black community, racialized communities. And so I'm really happy being involved in this project because it gives us a chance to re to right that wrong and to reset things in a way that is really driven by equity, access, and inclusion, um, and with working with communities in a trust space, culturally relevant, culturally safe, um, and you know, totally appropriate and ethical new platform that we can we can build from the ground up in in some ways, right? So it's meeting that gap as well as it's addressing some of those um, those early harms. Yeah, and I think like that's such a beautiful summary of, you know, the, the deep harm that was caused, but also the large gap that was left behind that I think people were left sort of needing services. 
Um, so as you can see, I'm glad we gave this a little more than two sentences um, because there's just so many different lenses to bring to this conversation. And so I have um, specific questions for each of you, but I want this to be conversational if possible. So if, if anyone has a point that they want to bring in or interject, please just do so. Um, but my first question actually is for, for Wendy. Um, so uh, we heard in the first half quite well, I think, what, what first exposure is, um, the website, the spirit behind it, the origin story. Um, so as the executive director, can you take us through some example use cases so that we can really understand and see sort of who this is for and how it would be used? Sure. There's many use cases, and I imagine my colleagues here may dig into one or two of their own, but. I you know, when I reflect on, on this, it's something as simple as the anxiety that we face, many of us have faced in COVID, being isolated. You know, the media was talking about how much people were drinking or using recreational drugs, self-medicating themselves. And, you know, in that situation, when sexual health clinics were closed down, when sometimes prenatal care may have been not in person or delayed, and people are drinking more, well, nine months down the road, we started to think about, what about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? What about, does that mean more babies are gonna be born with the effects of fetal alcohol? You know, what kind of education could a pregnant person or someone planning for pregnancy, where could they get that information easily? And yes, there are advocacy organizations out there for fetal alcohol, and we work with them but having all this in one place where people can browse, where they can pick it up on their hand, on the bus and look at it, pushing a stroller. This is the kind of access that someone who may be, you know, just having a question that they want an answer to quickly, that waiting can make all the difference. It can make a lifelong trajectory difference in a family. And so this is where that power I think comes from. So a case study as simple as that, and there could be, you know, in Cindy's clinic, patient comes in on five medications. Mm -hmm. So there could be many different angles to this, but yeah. I would say the self-medication angle is, is one of those ones for me where first exposure can make a huge difference. And I love that example because as a patient, you know, you want to make the access as barrier-free as possible, right? You know, sometimes it's hard to walk in and ask somebody or have that conversation in person, and that might be your only way to do it. So if there's ways to access that information, otherwise I think that's a really, really important point. I'm not gonna let you go though, I have another question for you, because I wanna upfront address a potential elephant in the room. I know we've referred to mother risk today, um, and we've also called it the former program. Um, so most of us are familiar, so the mother risk program was based at SickKids. It closed its doors in 2019 amidst a scandal with its drug testing laboratory, but it also had a general helpline for safety information that we heard have, has helped thousands. Um, and so it's really clear to me that first exposure is not related or associated with mother risk in any way. But Wendy, can you further explain to us how first exposure is different conceptually and in practice, and maybe also how it's similar? Sure. So one of the things that's really different is that we're not a lab. You know, that's right up front. So this, was a, this is a situation for us where really we're focusing on right now the drug information and getting that information out to the public. But it's not something that you can just read off of the monograph on the bottle. So what we had to do was bring together first the brain trust of people across the continuum of care. So it's not just specialist physicians, but also harm reduction experts, primary care providers, folks who get everything from the preconception right to the afterbirth period and deeply. Um, we brought them together to look at that evidence, but then you know what, in summarizing it, it needs to be nuanced further. It needs to be put into different kinds of language and literacies. It needs to be you know, communicated in culturally safe ways. And it's not for people, I'm looking around the room, maybe some of us might still be in the childbearing uh, <laughs> bracket, but we're talking about <laughs> offering this information to people that are you know, coming up. It's the next generation, right? So we're, we wanna pitch this information to, to people that are in their 20s and 30s and and coming up in those years, and they're in a very different digital channel of information. You know, we still need the posters, we still need hard copy resources, but we also need to meet the needs of the population where they are. Yep. And so this has been a great opportunity, I think, in terms of establishing a new way of doing business. Yeah. You know, First Exposure's core business is offering that evidence-based information, but 
how we do it is through that interdisciplinary team lens and also with the view on making sure that you know when you're thinking about supply chain you're thinking about last mile but for us we want this to be available to the whole population not just those populations that find it easy to access information so in that approach i think everybody's had something to contribute around how we reach um, those folks but i'll leave it to the experts to let you know all of the ways that the science has been really really tailored mm -hmm. to make sure that it's really correct I also heard you dropping some MBA terms like supply chain, which I appreciated. Um, <laughs> um, but can I add on to that? Because I think that, you know, we're kind of like coding over it a little bit. But Wendy and I have worked on a number of projects over the last couple of decades now, which, you know, is why we're like. <laughs> but I think one of the things that we've mainly worked on is this idea of using what we kind of call as a first people's first approach. And Cindy, we've worked on some projects around that as well. And it's this idea that it's not just around centering an indigenous aspect of it, you know, within a larger program, but really, how do we actually take uh, a framework where we actually design something for the community who's been the most underserved or the most damaged or the most harmed by uh, a program or service who's had the least access and also has the worst health outcomes. And that largely in Canada is indigenous populations, but also racialized populations and other underserved groups. Ha if we can design it in a way that actually addresses um, that population first, it makes it more accessible, more culturally safe, more culturally relevant for all populations. And so I, I think that that's one of the main reasons why representation matters, right? So my role on the board of direct, you know, on the board as a chair within Health Nexus and as the community delivery partner has allowed for that framework, that equity and ethical kind of framework to be really front and center. And I think that's an important, uh, really critical piece to this in addition to the scientific piece. And to see those partnerships right from the get-go, right from inception, I think that that's a completely different way of doing things. I mean, I'm, Cindy, I'm going to put you on the, on the hot seat now. <laughs> so I think making sure that the information on the first exposure website is high quality, evidence-based, and up-to-date is essential to people trusting it as a resource. And you're the medical content director. So can you, we've heard a little bit about the protocols, but I'm just wondering in your words, what are the processes that are in place to make sure that this is the case with the information that's on the website? And what types of expertise do you need around the table to make that happen? I think that my answer will flow very nicely from what Wendy and Sarah have shared already in that you know, we, have, we have a rigorous structure, we call it a, a standard operating procedure for how we do the research, review the literature, review the data that's available on current medications and substances. Uh, but that process, how we, how we do that, how we interact with each other has been really central to the work and really that's been part of the gratifying experience being involved with this project. So on the one hand, we have uh, you know, wonderful folks, Elizabeth and uh, uh, Fina, who um, uh, help us with so much of the literature research and our experts, uh, Tali and, and Jonathan um, and Jay, um, who, uh, who contribute to, um, to the expertise and to the analysis of that information. Um, but equal weight uh, is given to the scientific component and to, I guess what I'll call the community component. So, how, how, the, how the community connections and partnerships actually inform the work. It's baked into the, into the process that is part of the procedure. And it takes time to build that kind of structure in order to do this quite complex work that, that we are doing. Um, but the result, I think, is one that will instill trust and that shows that engagement that we took the time, we, we did the work together um, to, uh, to create um, something that is both um, scientifically sound and that will measure up to any other um, uh, medication or substance um, uh, exposure uh, framework that you can find uh, in other countries, uh, but also that it's very true to our values and to the communities that, um, uh, that will be accessing this information. Um, so I think that um, it's important to, for everybody to know that that's been such an important aspect of our process. And that's incredibly difficult because you need to have such a clear vision, but then you're engaging these communities. You need to be open enough to make the changes that are being suggested um, and think about a non one size fits all approach of doing things. And that complicates things. Oh, absolutely. Um, but you guys have done that from, from the very beginning, which is, I think, wonderful. 
Um, I want to take a step back, though, from the creating the information from the website, and I have a question, Anique, for you. Um, so in order to provide evidence-based information to pregnant individuals and providers, we first need to generate best evidence upstream to this entire process. And so as a perinatal pharmacoepidemiologist, can you walk us through how exactly we generate drug safety data for pregnant and lactating individuals? I mean, we heard earlier today that we know pregnant individuals are excluded from a lot of trials historically. And so I'm interested to know sort of what are the challenges in generating best evidence? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you for the question. I always refer to five points. The first one is, thank God, the adverse events uh, of pregnancy are rare. So we think about three to 5%. If you talk about uh, malformation, it can go all the way to nine to 10%. If you think of prematurity, depending on how you measure it. So it remains very rare. So in order to actually do research, you need an extremely large sample size. So large sample size is your go-to, your first go-to. So um, second point, uh, everything we do, the majority, 99%, is observational because you don't randomize uh, pregnant women to receiving a drug or having a placebo in pregnancy. So we do observational research. Therefore, there's a risk of bias. So there's uncertainty when we do publish our results. So the importance of replication. So I do a study in Canada, um, and someone does a study in Scandinavia or in Africa. So we reproduce. If we reproduce pretty much the same results, we're good to go. The third point is biological plausibility. So does that make sense? Do we have a mechanism that can explain you know, this drug taking at this point in time can have this effect. Many times we don't have this information, okay? Keep in mind, thalidomide, we had no biological plausibility before we started prescribing for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy at the beginning. After we went back, we got the, the biological plausibility. Uh, but that, that was after many pregnancies were exposed. And then once, if we have all of this, then we have to make sure that it applies to the people, goes back to what Sarah was saying, the people that are actually are using the medication. You know, Do we have data on the indigenous, in the black community? Um, so, and not only that, you know, those far and remote area, uh, newcomers. So many times we have very little data on this, so we have to generate this. We have to make an effort to generate this, this data. And if we have all of this, well, we have to make sure that pregnant women and the prescribers as well know about these findings. So there's milestones, let's say, in doing all of this. Um, How long does it take to go through those milestones on average? How many years are we talking? Okay, so if... Uh, not my data, <laughs> but uh, it takes on average about 10 years to identify a drug as fetotoxic. So during this 10 years, there's a lot of prescribing and unprescribing people refrain from using these medications because we're not sure, is it fetotoxic, is it, and I'm not talking about teratogenic. So fetotoxic, it increases the risk of prematurity, maybe low birth weight. Um, so it takes a long time, but I know you want to come to this at the end, so I'm just going to give a little scoop. With um, machine learning, <laughs> we're trying to reduce this time frame to about five, six years. Uh, yeah. I'm excited to hear more about that. Um, so, you know, we've talked quite a bit about data and about process. Um, so I want to segue now to talk about communities and trust. And so, Sarah, in developing a birthing center and in leading a national indigenous innovation impact investing platform, you clearly needed in that work to develop trusting relationships to succeed. And so I'm going to ask you specifically, how do we build trust with future users of first exposure? And specifically, how do we ensure that first exposure as a program builds trusting relationships with several different communities that cross different landscapes? Yeah, it's a million dollar question. Well, and I think the formula is actually the same. So I'll tell you like just a small story, which is going back to when I was first trying to establish my clinical practice as a midwife with work, wanting to work with the indigenous community here in Toronto. I, you know, I tried the classic put up flyers and no one was coming. 
um, kind of piece. And so I started doing these focus groups and engagements with community. And what I learned early on was that if you actually want to reach the community, you need to go to the grannies and the aunties. And that's what the elders told me. You need to go to the grannies and the aunties because that's who people go to. That's who the pregnant people go to to find out. What do I do now? I just found out I'm pregnant. Where do I go? Where do I get information from? That's who they trust, right? And so if you actually get the trust of the grannies and the aunties, then they will come. And so that's what we did for the midwifery practice, for the birth center, and even you know, kind of the other platforms and work that I've done. And that's one of the main premises of this kind of concept of a first people's first approach is how are we reaching out to the communities, elders, aunties, knowledge keepers, and really creating that space. And things move at the speed of trust. And so if you don't actually start out with building that trust with the community, then you're gonna be behind at every step of the way. But if you start there, then you can move at the speed of trust and move with with folks. And so we've started, we have this really great indigenous, um, indigenous you know, grannies advisory circle. We have a black uh, community advisory circle. And we're really working to identify how we can build those relationships of trust with other equity deserving groups, right? The queer, you know, LGBTQ you know, Q plus queer community, the street affected people who are, you know, impacted by, um, you know, or, street affected in various ways, uh, youth, other racialized groups, uh, disabled groups. So I think it's actually, that's the, the main key is how are we engaging with the community? And if you start there, then the rest will fall in place. Sometimes, how do you know who's not in the room? Like I know this is iterative, but sometimes that's the most difficult part. And I know I'm putting you on the spot asking you that, but any, any thoughts there? Well, we know what systems and processes look like, right? They don't look like the communities they often serve. And so one, it's at that, you know, that larger system governance level of starting to shift to make sure those spaces that where decision making happens are reflective of the communities that they serve. And it also just starts by asking that question every single time at every single meeting, who's not in the room, right? And you know, what would that voice be bringing? What would that perspective be bringing? And how are we making sure that we're making those connections? And how are we making sure that we're meaningfully accountable to those relationships as well, right? It's not just a matter of tick, we consulted with X, Y, or Z community. It's really creating those accountability pathways back. So Cindy, you mentioned that you know, your team engages and embeds community partners throughout the entire content creation process. So before we move on, I was just wondering if you could briefly touch on why that's also essential in addition to what Sarah mentioned to building trust. Well, I think that with the, um, the inclusion of community voices, um, you really get to, you get to know what are the issues in that community that need to be addressed. So rather than having an organization say, well, these are the things that you should be concerned about, you're listening and understanding from the community what are the issues that, that need to be addressed. Um, I think it's, it's really uh, been interesting working within the Black Village Leadership Circle and understanding you know, what are the, the pressing issues in black reproductive health and black, black pregnancy health. Um, so things that come to mind are things like hypertension and prematurity and, um, and diabetes and pregnancy. And these are not, of course, unique to the black community, but we, we do see um, disparate outcomes in terms of, of, of pregnancy wellness. Um, and, uh, and so these are, are issues that you know, we would like to have addressed. And so the, um, the portion of the first exposure website that will be devoted to black health will in time feature those areas which are most relevant to the community. Um, there are herbs and substances that have been passed down from generations. Um, we also call on the aunties to, uh, to <laughs> provide that guidance and the grannies and the, and the dads and the granddads. And, um, and so uh, there'll be an opportunity to feature that kind of culturally relevant information for our community. So um, it, has a, it has a great resonance to, to be able to bring you know, our voice forward as part of this, part of this uh, pro program. I'm laughing to myself because I'm South Asian and the auntie network in South Asian culture is extreme. I see some nods. The auntie is extremely powerful. And the 2.0 version of that is the auntie WhatsApp network. And if you penetrate <laughs> that, that's very powerful. There you go. I say it in jest, but at the same time, these distribution channels to reach different communities are different than what we think. Yes. So putting it up on a website doesn't necessarily mean that people will come. And so the awareness of this is actually really, really important and can't be understated. Mm -hmm. Now, Annette, you've been waiting very patiently. Oh, <laughs> and I do have a question for you. So, so currently, First Exposure is a website. 
and future plans include a call center as well as a clinical program among other things and these mediums make sense to me in my age bracket mm -hmm. um, but I want to ask you given your experience in education how do we design this resource to be of use to the reproductive population of the future and so to take a step back what are the knowledge and resource needs of young Canadians that we need to consider here as we look to the future of this program um, well, something I've, I've observed with um, young people, so I work at a girls' school right now, and you know, so it's something that um, you know, perhaps I come into contact with every day, um, is uh, there is a willingness to talk about their experiences, their health, and things of that nature. Um, an example of that will be well-being. You know, they're really open to the, the culture of well-being um, at school and talking openly about challenges they might have. So I think this is no exception. Um, and I think the other piece that's, that, that strikes me as important is a sense of autonomy over um, the information, uh, over their participation in the information. So I think those are kind of two things that come to mind. And um, so kind of keeping that in the frame and to everyone's point about kind of meeting them where they are, um, obviously social media is going to be the way to do it. But there are risks with, with social media, as we've said early on, and in fact, it was in the video as well. Um, and I think so, so something like that, you know, moderated well by first exposure would be a, a really good way of doing that. A discussion forum, you know, podcasts, things of that nature, I think would be a better way of reaching a group like this. They're always online. That's, let's meet them where they are. You know, they're already there discussing other things, you know. So I think doing things to kind of spark their interest and attract their attention uh, might be a way of doing that. And I think um, there are you know, it's already a digital resource. So we're already kind of halfway there with three quarters of the way there. And Sabina has already done a lot of work in that space with um, her, her other website. So I think, um, you know, there, there is just a little bit more work to be done um, uh, in that space. And um, I think the final thing I'll say about that is I did do some market research on this. So I did actually ask some of the younger girls teenagers, um, the ones I knew well because I didn't want them to kind of, <laughs> Una what are you promoting? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also sort of, you know, women in their 20s, um, you know, about, about what I was thinking about saying today. And so I think, you know, I think we might be on the right track if we think about some of those options. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's also, it sounds important to also be sort of, again, like rapidly iterative. Like I just think of like my like one year old and he already knows to put his fingerprint over where you yeah. unlock a phone and he's one. Yeah. <laughs> and so I can't even imagine in 10 years what the technology is gonna look like. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we get stuck in what we know, but we're actually designing this for generations beyond us, which yeah. I think is really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think the openness that they have um, with respect to these issues is going to just keep growing. I think social media kind of brought them up that way. Good or bad? Good or bad? Good or bad? I, I think I want to open this up to everyone because I think that, like, you know, if I'm wondering if you guys have anything to add to this because are there new or emerging technologies either on the research side or on the distribution side of the information that should be considered or explored when we're future thinking about first exposure beyond the website? I, I would say, you know, when we think about how first exposure is going to grow, it's definitely going to grow in the range of substances, medicines, plant medicines that we can offer but it's also gonna grow more deeply in, in terms of the, that interactivity. And whether that's in being able to uh, you know, meet an expert, ask an expert, and receive timely information about your case, whether it's about getting an appointment where you can have your case record reviewed. Um, you know, we'd like to be, and Anik has shared, you know, there are people across the country, but you can't make a toxicologist pregnancy specialist in a couple of years. This is a subspecialty that can take 15 years of training to get that kind of knowledge. And so we want to link up this resource across the country even further and together be able to offer more and more personal, more and more interactive. So say call up or, you know, interact through the, the electronic medical record even. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it opens up a tremendous amount of communication. But we have to start small. We have to make sure that the information is kept safe on the website in a basic form first. Yep. We don't want to start interacting with personal health information before our technology is ready and it's been tested. So that's what we're going to do now. And in the course of mapping out what does this participation look like? What does this collaboration look like across the country? We expect you're going to see very soon new releases on first exposure, um, but with funding and some additional relationships where I think we really need them is to move us to that national program level 
you're going to see this linked up with many of the other agnostic digital systems that can allow for a program like this to match with a national pharmacare strategy, match with an electronic medical record, and really enable an interdisciplinary care team to focus their care on, on the pregnant person where it belongs. So think big, start small, um, and it could be virtual care platforms, it could be chat GPT based, it could be AI, like safely, safely, Always safely first. Yeah, exactly. You have to walk before you can run. Um, I'm wondering, Anik, if you want to talk a bit about, you alluded to it before in your previous answer about machine learning and reducing the time that it takes to generate new evidence. Just before we close, do you want to touch briefly on that? Um, sure. Um, you know, the way research, and it's the same in every field, it's not specific to pregnancy, but you need to have a signal first. So you have to have a, a case that came out or something that came in the news, or so a signal in any shape or form. And then you create a hypothesis and then you go and you study it. That takes time. Um, but we already have access to a lot of data in Canada. It's called real world data. It's the data that is generated regularly with our healthcare, um, you know, billing databases, hospitalization, patient charts, um, uh, in our case, birth certificates. So there's already very, very large cohorts that are put in place across Canada in a very state-of-the-art, uh, valid way, uh, keeping confidentiality, you know, perfect. So. But so using, so leveraging the, these big databases, we are putting in place a machine learning research program to identify signals, but faster, before something happens almost. So basically it's gonna be quick and dirty, so it's gonna be a signal, it won't be necessarily a causal effect, but the signals will come, will be generated, and afterwards we'll do research, but instead of having one signal every year, we'll have a handful, many signals every year that we will investigate. So it's gonna you know, uh, increase our capacity to actually uh, make causal associations. So for the risks, of course, but never forget the benefits. Um, so, um, so this is where we are right now. So oh, thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, I think we're coming to the end of our time. I think this is all the time we have for today. We're gonna to try to end uh, right at 2.15. Um, the hour just flew by. I think we probably could have talked for another hour or more. Um, mm. But how I like to end these discussions is, and I'm gonna keep you guys to one to two sentences <laughs> this time. I'm gonna be stricter about it. Um, is I like to give everyone what I call the last word. And this is an important message that you wanna leave all of us with from your lens. And so I'm gonna go in the op, try to go in somewhat of the opposite order of what we started. Um, so Sarah, Annette, Anik, Cindy, and Wendy, we'll go this way. Can you, in a, in a sentence or two, and I will cut you off, uh, leave us with your, your last word. So Sarah, I'll uh, get you to go first. Yeah, well, I mean, we've already demonstrated that there's a big gap and there's a need for this kind of information source for all Canadians, right? Um, you know, birth, uh, pregnancy birth, it's, it's one of those some, one of those situations that crosses every socio-economic, geographical, um, you know, political, um, age-related spectrums, right? All of those demographics, we all, each and every one of us here has a birth story. And so providing this kind of a platform that can increase access to information, it can increase uh, choice and informed choice in information and it can improve outcomes, this is something that's gonna be benefit everyone that lives in Canada. Thank you for going first. And that? Uh, well, my day job is um, as an advancement professional, and um, so I would say that um, transformational philanthropy, like what Sabina and Craig did, um, can move um, items on the national agenda. So I think you know that uh, can be underestimated. Transformational philanthropy. I think we're going to remember that, and that's going to stay with us. Any? Um, historically prescribing a medication to a pregnant woman historically, so many years before, has been very pat paternalistic, you know. Physicians say, mm, I think you need this, take, th take this, so woman will take it. And then it created a lot of harm because women was, were not able to actually make their own decisions. Um, it's true in certain communities more than others, I, I agree with that. 
But I think uh, a, you know, uh, an infrastructure or a service like First Exposure, giving a valid, reproducible uh, results on risks, on benefits of medication use, Given this information, I strong, strongly believe that pregnant women or individuals will make an informed um, decision on their health care. And I think this in itself is, is you know, uh, excellent. Cindy? Mm -hmm. I think as the interactivity of first exposure grows, I think we have an opportunity to hear signals, you used the word signals, um, even earlier perhaps, and that will be through some of the work that, uh, that Jay um, does around uh, harm reduction in pregnant individuals, um, in the black circle, in the indigenous granny circle as well. Uh, I think we'll have an ability to hear about um, substances, medications, um, their impact in the community, and sort of the, the more pressing experiences people are um, having in their pregnancy care. So I think this could be really powerful going forward. And Wendy, get the last word. <laughs> you know, I would say join us. I don't think there's any group here or any profession here that could do this work on its own. Um, it's going to take a real collaboration. And so I would just put it out there to, as an invitation to the national community. If you see yourself in this program, come join us. There's lots of ways that you can participate and um, we're really looking forward to working with you. I think that's a great way to close the panel. Um, so thank you guys so much for this discussion. And with that, I see uh, Stainey is here, so I'm gonna invite him back to the podium uh, to close this out. I think we should go. <laughs> Make sure that people online. Oh, thank you. So, you know, I, I know a little bit of what that's like, but if we can reduce, if not just the health consequences, at least the fear and the anxiety, that'll be a wonderful thing. Um, it's important for me personally, right? And no child ever dreams of being a dean, right? Uh, if they do, it's a very sad child. <laughs> but the nice thing about being at a school of public health and being surrounded by really you know, smart, intelligent, motivated people, is that you actually get a little bit of a platform and a little bit of a pulpit to try to make things better. Now, that's sometimes hard in the world of doing grants. Uh, it's sometimes hard in the world of kind of getting papers out or just making sure that classes are staffed. But when an opportunity like this comes along, it actually kind of brings you back to what's really important about public health. You know, at this point, you know, the, it's usually typical for someone in my role to look at a, a donor and say, Thank you very much for your gift. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, what I'm actually gonna say is thank you very much for the vision. It's that vision and the guidance, at times the nudging, that's really, really, really helpful. And that's what actually brings something beautiful into the world. So thank you for that, Sabine. And I hope you'll pass our thanks on to Craig as well. Um, it's also important for where we are in public health right now. So for the last little while, I've been working with some colleagues. I've been on sabbatical, as France pointed out. Um, and one of the things that people keep on sending me now is these little clips off the internet. Uh, and my favorite one recently was, uh, spinach is the cause of all knee pain. And it was a very earnest sounding person uh, who rattled off some credentials that I've not heard about. 
Uh, and she was sure that spinach causes knee pain. Now, I'll use kind of a light example, right? And anyone here, don't stop eating spinach, okay? And the biology, the genetics, the chemistry that she talked about all were wrong. But we live in a world of profound misinformation. And all public health is, is the application of science and critical reflection at scale with the goal of improving health. So the ability to kind of bring forward evidence and apply it at scale, like this has the, you know, already is, but has the potential to do even more, that's profoundly important to restoring the strength of public health. We live in a world of a lot of mistrust now. Uh, I tend to keep my politics very much to myself. Uh, what that's meant is the world become more and more polarized. Uh, people from both sides of the political spectrum won't talk to me anymore, which is great. I'm quite happy with that as an academic. <laughs> but, you know, we need to find ways to actually bring communities together. We need to find ways that people find common cause and common purpose with things that are matter now and matter into the future. And that's, again, an important way that public health will sustain itself because it will have not just evidence, but hopefully trust and a shared understanding of that. And it's important to me as well because, you know, when again, I'm coming back and saying just exactly what you said, right? This starts with kids, right? It's very, very, very hard to set someone up for health if they've not been, had that first bit of health. And whatever starts with them actually transmits down as well. We've known this for a long time. We know it's true of chemicals. We know it's true of genetics. We know it's true of social factors. The more that we can set people up, that first exposure to be as healthy as it can, the more that we'll actually correct uh, things for a longer and better life. And that's actually really important for public health as well. We're in a period of great debate, a lot of strife, a lot of fractiousness. The more that we can take that longer view, the more those issues shrink to be very, very small. And so I'm really grateful for it in those three ways. You know, personally, it's very important to me, uh, my relationship with my mother. It's important to me for kind of what motivates me uh, to do the job I do and to stay in the School of Public Health. And I think it's important for uh, what I do professionally. I think we have a, a slide to thank everyone. No? There we go. And I think I have another one. Great. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading all that out. Uh, as you can probably tell, I've had a little bit of dental surgery. I've not been drinking, I promise. Um, but a little hard for me to articulate everything. But I'm really grateful for everyone here. Uh, Wendy, I'm really grateful to you and your team. I'm looking for Sarah, who's been a great champion and supporter at Health Nexus for us. Grateful for our team at the school and for everyone who's come here. Uh, and Sabina, uh, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I think this is it, everyone. And uh, there may be a few things left outside to nibble on, but otherwise, really appreciate everyone being here today. Thank you, and wish us all luck if you're thinking about anything tonight. Thank you.